Production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Vouchers, Medicaid, the mega site, and more tonight on Behind the Headlines. I'm Eric Barnes with The Daily Memphian. Thanks for joining us. I am joined tonight by Karen Camper, Minority Leader in the State House. Thanks for being here again. Thank you for having me. Along with Jesse Chisholm, a House member newly elected to the State House. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Along with Bill Drees, reporter with The Daily Memphian. So we'll talk through uh, as many of the issues as we can get to. It's the beginning of the session, although in some ways the session, a lot of debate and conversation has been going on for, for a bit now, but it's the beginning of the session. Uh, we'll talk through budget and Medicaid and Megasite and all kinds of things. But I want to start a little bit more broadly. Um, you are both Democrats. Yes. Um, and we invited Republicans to be on the show. Couldn't work that out, but we'll try to get them on. We, it's always preferable to have a, a mix of people here. Yeah. Um, but I'm curious, there are Republican supermajorities. And you, uh, Representative Cantor, leader, leader Camper, you've been up there for how long now? 12, going on 12? my 12th year. Mm -hmm. How hard is it to get things done when you're in the minority party in the way you all are in both the House and the Senate? Well, if you think about over the years that you've been there and the relationship you've built, you're able to get things done. You may seem like you're in a minority and there's gonna be some philosophical differences that you have with people, but basically on most issues, we agree. We may, agree, we may disagree about how to implement them, how to get to it, but most things we agree on. So members are able to get a lot of things done. And, and your month, <laughs> or you know, I mean, however, since the election, I mean, have you seen that or do you walk up there and, and go, oh my gosh, we are in a very small number of Democrats in a very red legislature and how are we ever gonna get anything done? Well, when I first got there, I said, hey, it, we're, in a major we're in a minority <laughs> here. It was, but. Uh, to uh, kind of mirror what uh, Leader Camper said, about 90% of the things that that come across, we, we agree on. Yeah. So, but at the other 10, though, we, 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 <laughs> we fight pretty hard about it. All right, let's bring Brent and Bill in. Um, let, let's get to vouchers, uh, what the governor calls education savings accounts. Uh, and, and he has moved to uh, move this up by a year. It was going to take effect starting with the school year in August of 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, now he wants to move that up to August 2020. Is that doable? It can be doable except for the fact that there is a belief that the uh, bill was unconstitutional. So there either is a lawsuit pending that, uh, that could affect the implementation of it. If it's not, I do think he's gonna to try to rush through, get it done so that, you know, it's already in motion, it's already going, which would give another uh, version of it in terms of dealing with the courts. But yeah, I think, I think it's possible that it could get done, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. Now, based on what has happened this week, uh, there's a member of the Republican leadership that feel like we don't need to do it this year. And he is trying to put together a coalition to try to push it off to next year and let's just kind of slow walk it, let's think through everything and not be rushed about it. So it's possible on both ends, if you will. And, and again, these school vouchers w would apply only to Shelby and, and, and Davidson County. Mm -hmm. So Representative Chisholm, do you anticipate uh, hearing a lot about this from your constituents, fr from educators in your, in your district as well? Of course. Uh, seeing that the bill affects Davidson and Shelby County, I think that's the makings of a bad bill. Uh, anytime you have a bill that's only going to affect two parts, two parts of the state, and everyone else kind of don't have to get a, be a part of it, it makes things look a certain way. So, I believe that uh, it, it was a bad bill. I, and, and, and the bill is seventy-one. Just so people who maybe haven't followed as closely, it's seventy-one hundred dollars for uh, up to five thousand students split yeah. across Shelby and Davidson. And so separate from the, the, the questions about it only applying to certain parts of the state or the lawsuit or everything, do you, Representative Chisholm, have families in your district who say, yeah, I, I, I'd love to have $7,100 to get my child into a, quote, better school? Well, of course, you're gonna, we're gonna have some that say, 
I would love to have $7,100 to choose what school. However, you have, the, you have uh, well, you have public, public funds going into private schools. And a lot of the constituents that I've heard from ha have an issue with that. Yeah, and for you, do you hear from families who say, look, I mean, $7,100, I want to be in a better school. Uh, I want it. They, they don't care about some of these process and, and issues that come up. I actually have not heard from a lot of people in my district that have said that. I've heard from people outside of my district that have said that. And they, you know, in their minds, you have these children that are trapped, is the word that they would use, in these schools, and they should be able to, you know, uh, take the voucher and, and attend another school. Uh, but they don't have an appreciation for um, the tuition at those schools, the transportation against those schools, and then those are the kind of things that we were saying, if you're gonna have a bill like this, make it to where the people that can take advantage of it can actually get to the schools and have the wraparound services and the things that they need in order to fully take advantage of it. Yes, Bill, let me get back in. Uh, Leader Camper, you, you were in the legislature when I think this came up before. There was a bill that was passed that, that involved the school's demerger yes. that applied only to Shelby County, and that went to court, and the court said, you can't do that. Uh, so it, 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 is this a replay of that, of that principle, do you think? Uh, uh, yeah, I do think. <laughs> I do think, um, but that doesn't stop people from uh, trying to push their agenda and their views and things that they want to happen based on their own beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, I think our system here has been under a lot of stress and strain, and adding one more layer to that is going to be challenging. It's, it's going to be challenging to keep traditional schools open and fully funded. It's going to be challenges for even the public charter schools you know, to do the things that they need to do. And in Tennessee, if you think about in an overarching scenario, still is, is, you know, in the bottom 10 of funding traditional public schools. So if our system was fully funded to a way to make a difference that, that we're saying this voucher is gonna do, we wouldn't even need it. Mm -hmm. Because the school system we have would be able to do the things that we're saying vouchers are supposed to do. Well, the, the, and, and the reason that I that I bring that up it, it is because I think it goes to the point of of how much is is Memphis in particular being isolated by what the legislature does. Mm -hmm. Well, first off, there's a perception that this need is primarily in Memphis. Shelby County. And even members who don't believe in the philosophy of it can buy into it because it does not affect them. And so if it affects their districts, they would have a different view. Mm -hmm. Well, in part, mm -hmm. I mean, the critics would say that that's how the bill got passed last year. The, well, bill, the, the vote was kept open. And once Knox, Knox County yeah. was, was exempted effectively, and uh, they, the votes came through and Hamilton County was exempted and all the rural areas were, were exempted right. to get the bill done. Well, and that, back true. to what you're saying about that's a bad bill. Yep, of course. Yeah. And what happens next with the, as we talk about education, I mean, we, the, what's the future of the ASD, the Achievement School District, which took over what, Bill, 30 schools in Shelby County, a number in Davidson. It's very much in flux. There've been a lot of questions about it. I mean, that's, you talk about this uncertainty and where things are going, that's, that's another piece of the uncertainty, right? It is another piece of the uncertainty, but I will say that I believe that this commissioner is taking a hard look at The it. education commissioner? Yes, I finish, will finish say, went. finish when. I will, be, I will say I believe she is taking a hard look at it. I don't know what her plan or strategy is gonna be for it, but I will say that she is rethinking the ASD. Representative Chisholm, one year down, you're into your second year of your of your term in 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 Nashville. Um, your thoughts on the budget process, where the budget is going? Uh, that's a lot to take in during the first year. Yes, uh, it is. It is. Um, uh, for, well, first finding finding the restroom that was uh, that was <laughs> you know that was a, that was a hard part. Then once I got that down, pack everything mm -hmm. else kind of came second wind. But uh, the whole process, the, the process as a whole has been in quite a learning experience, uh, especially the budget, because it's so complex, seeing how so many things are affected by 
a dollar here, a dollar there. Everything affects each other. So it's been quite a thing. There's been some discussion about the uh, tax on food uh, and and he, when he was in town the, the, this past week, Governor Lee said, well, you know, everybody's for reducing taxes, but when you talk about which taxes to reduce, that's when the real discussion begins and and that's when you start to find disagreement. So so where are you on, on, on the food tax? Uh, well, I, I am aware that all of the programs that we ask for, the things that we need in our communities, all these things take funding. And there has to be some taxes somewhere. On the food tax, I, I have to look at it a, a little bit further to see how, how deep the rabbit hole really goes. But mm -hmm. uh, from the surface, it's something that I'm, I'm, kind, of, I'm kind of on the fence about. Mm -hmm. I really am. Mm -hmm. R Representative Camper. Yeah. Let me just say that, um, there is a bill this year that Representative Hazelwood has that would give a food tax holiday for about, I want to say two months. And to fund that, to just take all of the taxes off of all food for just those two months, it's almost $200 million. And this would be on a recurring basis if we choose to keep doing it. Right. So right now, with a big budget surplus. And it seems like everything is great. But you know whenever there's a hill going up, it will come down. So if we were to remove those funds out on a permanent recurring basis, I think long term we would have some problems. So by just doing maybe the tax holiday like we do, school supply holidays, a one time thing, maybe not two months, shorten it or something like that, I think uh, the constituents would appreciate it. But I'm not sure how long term we could sustain it. Mm -hmm. And the, this is in the budget that was put forward recently. Uh, the governor is looking to add what uh, six hundred million dollars worth of new money to K through twelve, back to education. But that's he a is. huge part of the budget, uh, pushing the total to seven point two billion, including one hundred and seventeen million in uh, teacher raises. Uh, is that is this the time to be spending that money on education and it, versus cutting taxes? Oh no! Yeah, I think it's time. I, no, I think we need to spend it on education because, uh, first off, I think that um, we have traditionally not fully funded education, which is why we're in the situation we're in with some of our schools being on these priority lists. So yes, we need to pay our teachers more. No problem. We definitely need to do that. I appreciate the two hundred and fifty million dollars that he's putting into the mental health trust fund for students. I mean, I, well, I, I go to speak to kids all the time, and a lot of them are dealing with mental health issues, concerns, uh, grief, all kind of things. So if they had a counselor there that they can talk to to help them through that, I think that's great. So I'm not, I'm not arguing any of that. Well, one thing that came up um, in recent weeks was funding for the mega site. So the West Tennessee mega site is a big dedicated industrial site in what, Fayette and Haywood, Haywood. County. Mm -hmm. Haywood County. Uh, there are three around the state. One is outside Chattanooga. It's where the Volkswagen plant went mm -hmm. to billions of dollars in investment there. One in Middle Tennessee that's seen a fair amount of investment, no investment in the West Tennessee one. And certainly the economic development people in business community in Memphis, much of it, maybe not all, much of it really wants to see that there's some $70 million worth of work for sewage mm -hmm. for getting it, quote, shovel ready for a tenant. The governor at one point seemed to be saying, and the, the commissioner, the uh, commissioner of Edu economic development at yeah. the state seemed to be saying, no, we want to wait till we get a tenant before we spend more money. The economic development people in Memphis, many of them are saying, you got to spend the money before you get a tenant. Where do you stand on that chicken egg <laughs> debate? I think we need to spend the money. I think we have invested a lot uh, uh, for, for the Beggar site so far. And this is like the last leg. And I think we need to go ahead and deal with it. Because what happens when, when these companies are looking to come here, if you've got a sewage or a water problem, then they're on to the next state, to be honest with you. Then, then, I mean, they're just on to the next state. So with the investment we've already made, at this point where we have over $900 million one-time money that we can use, I see no problem with taking that $70 million and in, The $900 million coming from the surplus. From right the surplus, from yes. The surplus, yes. You, you were nodding as she was speaking. Yeah, to, to piggyback on that, yeah, we, we have to finish that in order to, to get a tenant. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times, you, you know, you have, it's just like an unfinished building, and you, you want a tenant to come in. Well, it's easier if you have it already done. Yeah. So if we have so much money already spent, it, it wouldn't make any sense to stop when we're 80% there. Right. 
uh, a bill with 10 minutes left. Working its way through the committee system is a bill that, that uh, a crime bill that would uh, define an offense as community terrorism. Uh, this, this is made to, to seen as a way to combat the, the shootings that we've experienced, uh, things like that. What do you think about that bill? Well, let me, let me just say this and then I'll turn it over to the representative because he's a co-sponsor of this mm -hmm. bill. We just heard uh, the bill was up in, in judiciary this week. We had Stevie Moore from Stop the Violence, uh, Stop the Violence, Stop the Killing to come up and speak. So it's a lot of interest in it. Uh, but you're a co-sponsor yes. and you might want to talk about it. Well, on that particular bill, uh, a as we all know, there's been some tra really bad tragedies happening in, in our community. We know we've had children die at home, getting ready to go to school, and we want to stiffen the penalties for drive-bys because actually there's nothing in the statute that mentions drive-bys. So we want to actually put something in there just to, to make it stronger, to deter people from committing those type of crimes, shooting into a car, uh, into a crowd, those kind of those kind of things. So we want to make sure that we had something that was stiff enough where uh, people would think twice about doing drive-bys. Do, do you think that that when someone does something like this, that they're thinking about what the penalty is going to be for it? I mean, it seems to be a heat of the moment thing. Well, it it can be at times heat of the moment, but uh, it can is also it could also be premeditated because when you're on the way you're thinking about it then mm -hmm. so we want to give them something else to think about while while doing this does that is that the bill there's a bill also to roll back um the extension of, of gun rights to your car so it was some years ago I, a year or two ago there was a bill that came out that said you know, the, the, the right to own a gun mm -hmm. in your home is extended to your car. Mm -hmm. I think, and you correct me if I'm wrong, Bill, I think every law enforcement person we've had on, Mike Rawlings, head of the mm -hmm. police department. Mike Rawlings is certainly Floyd complained Floyd Bonner, about head of, mm -hmm. of um, mm -hmm. the sheriff's office who was mm -hmm. on here recently, some other politicians have said there was a, they, they draw, I think the mayor, Strickland may have drawn yeah. a direct correlation between that bill and the increase in the highway shootings. Yeah. Do you, yeah. Is that, that part of this bill or is that a separate It's bill? not, it's two separate bills. One, uh, the bill that you're talking about when we created that, there's a lot of, uh, there's another bill to try to repeal that bill because of all the break-ins in people's cars and a lot of these guns have been stolen and then used to, to commit crimes. The bill he's talking about is sponsored by uh, Representative Hardaway yes. and it's strictly called community uh, com uh, terrorism. Yeah, community terrorism. And, and, and the other side where people have come to me with respect to this bill deals with the name of it, community terrorism. Yeah. And calling it terrorism has caused some people some concern. They understand that these type of actions are terror on the community, but they don't want it to morph into something different. So I think people want to make sure people are held accountable, mm -hmm. that there may be some stiffer penalties for these type of things, but calling it that, I think some people have some reservations about. So that's been sort of some of the pushback on the bill. They, they believe and support what we're trying to accomplish with the bill, but the title of it is what's the problem. Yeah, Bill. So uh, the governor's also a big advocate of criminal justice reform, and some of those bills mm -hmm. are starting to move through the legislature now that he's, he's had a year in, into office. Uh, this is a real balance, dealing with, with yeah. things like these shootings, but then dealing with the other side of it and, and to say, okay, who gets a second chance? Who, who needs some help to go straight once they do their, their, their time? Is the debate that nuanced or is it easier to be tough on crime but more difficult to, to say someone deserves a second chance? What's interesting in the state of the state, he used the term tough on crime or hard on, uh, that, that tough on crime terminology. But at the same time, he talks about um, restorative justice and uh, rehabilitating and, uh, you know, re-entry as something that's a priority for him. So I do think balancing it is going to be, you know, uh, his challenge because of his own terminology. Mm -hmm. So we haven't seen the nuances of his bills, but I do know that he's put money in the budget to support a lot of these reentry programs so that once a person have uh, repaid their debt to society, they, they deserve a right to move on. So that's something he believes in. 
based on where he's put funding? I believe the term tough on crime can be vague, uh, but we have to dis define what crimes are we going to be tough on. Are we being tough on crimes that, that scare us or crimes that make us mad? Mm -hmm. You know, for, because we have so many people who are in jail for a long time for nonviolent crimes. Are we tough on those crimes or are we tough on the crimes that scare us like murder, rape, and mayhem? Right, which is an important point, but because obviously you're a co-sponsor of, uh, of the bill that deals with community terrorism. Yeah. How much do you hear from constituents, I want you to be tough on crime versus, hey, I, I, I have a relative, I have a son or a daughter who's, who's just getting out of prison, who, who wants to go straight, but there are so many barriers in, in their way. What's kind of the balance that you hear about that? Yeah, well, there definitely has to be a balance in that. Uh, you know, I am on the Community Terrorism Act as a co-sponsor, but I'm also sponsoring another bill to end solitary confinement for juveniles and, and pregnant women. So we have to have, we have to have a balance. Mm -hmm. You know, when people do their time, when they get out, yes, they want you, you, we want them to be a part of society again. We want them to be able to, to get employment. We want them to be able to live a normal life and live in society. Uh, so there, there are many barriers for people who are coming out who want to, to turn their life around. So not only do we want to be tough on crime, but we also want to make sure that when people do their time, they're able to be included back into society. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, with uh, about five minutes left, uh, Medicaid. So the governor came forward uh, with uh, uh, a $7.9 billion block grant request to turn Medicaid into a block grant, the Medicaid money that comes from the federal mm -hmm. government. There is now a, uh, a movement, somewhat a bipartisan movement. It, it is probably unlikely to pass, but it's actually got bar bipartisan support, support to do Medicaid expansion. This mm -hmm. goes back to the Affordable Care Act, mm -hmm. Obamacare. Mm -hmm. States were allowed to expand, uh, get more money for state level right. Medicaid in exchange for uh, joining Obamacare. A lot of states didn't. I think it's now up to about 36 states, mm -hmm. including yeah. DC, have, have joined. Do you, one, see that any momentum behind the Medicaid expansion and two, what are the implications of the block grant from your point of view? I'm appreciative of the fact that there's a bipartisan bill to expand Medicaid. Um, at least in the House, it will get a discussion. Last time, we didn't even get a discussion. It was killed in the Senate, that was it. And I think that the more people hear about what it actually means, it may get some support. Now, do I think it'll pass? I'm not sure. Because of the Medicaid block grant, which is a political term, in my opinion, um, has been sent to Washington, and there, uh, there will be, you know, a discussion or a pushback, saying, well, let's see what the results of that is. Let's see what happens. Let's don't do both. If we're going to do this, let's think about it next year. So I think it would be some hemming and hawing around that. But I am appreciative of the fact that there is a bipartisan bill and that the House will get a chance to at least talk about it. And, and it's a representative in East Tennessee whose sister died, yes. and he did not realize she didn't have an insurance, and right. it came out that she didn't go get treatment because she right. wasn't getting insurance. A Republican, uh, East Tennessee, yeah, Republican who experienced France. that, you know, in mm -hmm. the worst possible way. Mm -hmm. And who is the representative locally? Who's, His, is it Lamar? Who's post pushing it locally? Or I'm saying that wrong. I have a bill you do. separate okay. and apart from this one. The co-sponsor on this particular bill is Representative Hodges from Chattanooga. Okay. So okay. Hodges and, Tra and Travis are the two okay. in the House that are pushing it, and then Senator Briggs in the Senate, who's so, always been for it. So what's your proposal on this? Mine is full, full Medicaid expansion. You okay. know. And, yeah. and the governor's block grant proposal went to Washington and the Trump administration um, rejected it in, in friendly terms, terms yes. uh, because they said Tennessee had not expanded Medicaid mm -hmm. and, the, and the states whose block grant proposals they accepted mm -hmm. had expanded mm -hmm. m m Medicaid. Medicaid. So, so what, what's, what's the read from Washington on this? Are I there, think are they're waiting for an official written response and not just a dialogue. I know they've been up there a couple of times, but they want something in writing. What my bill would do would take it out of the hands of the legislature and give the power back to the executive branch to just act however he wants to act. Call it the lead plan, call it whatever plan you want, but take it out of the General Assembly because it gets political. And, and Governor Haslam, when Governor Haslam proposed a form of Medicaid expansion, mm -hmm. he said on the front end that he was not going to do it without legislative approval, right. and he didn't have to do that. He did not. 
And mm -hmm. that's when it got political because now if you have a, a bill that goes against your personal philosophy that you're fighting anyway, then it gets political. Mm -hmm. So that, that's kind of how we got there. Just a minute left. And I should say we, we invited, uh, you, you were both Democrats, we invited yes. a number of Republicans. Yes. Couldn't work out the schedule, right. but we will hope to get them on in the future. And I should have mentioned that. There is a There are a number of bills that, that folks are viewing as anti-LGBT, uh, one about allowing people to uh, favor vendors who have local governments favoring vendors or contractors who have a uh, LGBT workplace. Another bill that was already signed allows faith-based orgs to refuse services to LGBT people. Mm -hmm. Is this uh, a road you're in support of uh, the state going down? On not allowing people to adopt? Yeah, yeah. No, I Any don't support that. I yeah. don't support that. I, no, I, I just think, I think we're going to create an environment where businesses are going to uh, hesitate to come here, where businesses are going to question whether or not, uh, you know, we're being fair. Uh, to employees and things like that. No, I don't support that. All right, we are out of time. Thank you both for being here. We hope to get you back. And thank you for joining us. Be sure to download the full podcast of Behind the Headlines on the Daily Memphian site or iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And join us again next week.